Good evening, dandies. Welcome to Undetermined, the podcast. Restrictions got eased like a little bit about oh, less than a week ago. Uh-huh. And, and, and all our states are closed off to each other, but we're like the same size as the US, but with only five states. So right. no, one's, no one's next door to anyone. Like there's no city that's near another state or anything. So that's all fine. But yeah, it'll be like the weird thing about it is seeing how the whole point now is to actually let more people get sick you know, <laughs> right. now, now that the hospitals are prepared for it. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's just a weird a weird thought. Yeah. I saw one meme that kind of sums it up in a lot of ways that like America is treating the coronavirus as a win in the same way that we won Vietnam. It just got too expensive and we gave up. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's over. It's like, no, it's really not. Yeah. Uh, Wash your hands. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> but it's kind of like, it's almost like a reflection of how people just are these days. Like, I'm bored. I'm bored of coronavirus. <laughs> like, right, yeah, I, I'm done with it. Let's let's look. Let's think about something else. You know, yeah. but it's inconvenienced it's still... me enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, yep. That means it goes away, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That's right. That's all you have to do. You just have to get tired of it, and then it disappears. Right. Well, and it goes to show what an entitled society a lot of us are. Not all of us. Yeah. But we have that entitlement that, oh, somebody else is struggling. Oh, poor them. Uh, well, you know, no. It's more like, oh, they shouldn't have broken that law. Right? But they'll go out and they'll stick their face in policemen's faces. Yeah. Um, yeah. And somebody <laughs> tells them, stay in your house today. Yeah. Right. You know? <laughs> right. For everybody's safety, let's just stay home. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> and Right? But if you shot my black friend, well... <laughs> Well, you, you should shouldn't have, have been stealing you those the law. You should have been paying attention. Yeah, got to be the law. But yeah, it's a. I it's kind of funny. I think I I saw it a little bit, and it's not like you know I'm Rasputin or anything. But I saw it kind of forming within God just a week into lockdown, probably in back in March, and you could tell like a lot of my extrovert friends were getting really anxious really quick. Mm. <laughs> you know, and they were ready to be done within like a week. And it's like, oh no, this is not going to fare well. Like, this is not, you know, these guys aren't going to make it. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty used to locking down a lot of cases, regardless of doing this show. I'm kind of an introvert anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've definitely never been bored ever. Right. So I just, I do miss, uh, I really miss hugging other people and I miss friends like i really i definitely do but i can't say that yeah i just keep seeing people online talking about how bored they are and i think fuck what did you used to do Do, like (laughs) because there's so there's so much stuff to do even when you're not allowed out you know yeah even just even just sit there thinking about stuff (laughs) you know like that's that's entertainment for me yeah absolutely yeah no i think that can totally be legitimate thing how, just the chance to stop and think exactly how many yeah. of us have that anymore yeah well up until the last few weeks yeah right? well, we haven't had that my dad's like kind of my, my dad's sort of semi-retired now but you know he's an academic like he taught in universities his whole life and he he loves taking the train somewhere ah. Because, you know, he usually gets to the other end and he goes, yeah, I had a good chance to think about, (laughs) you know, just something, just something he'd been meaning to think about for ages. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You're only limited by your imagination, I think. A lot of cases, some people are just kind of lacking that, I think, you know. Yeah. God, there's a million things. God, I've got a hundred art projects I haven't opened or started or, or, or anything else. And, you know, but I like mindless TV too sometimes. I mean, shit, a lot of the time. Yeah, films, stupid music. I think I love all kinds of shit. I never get bored. I hear you. I'm in the same boat. And we've definitely taken on this as an artistic endeavor of sorts. Yeah, it's not hurting the show. That's for sure. Yeah, you know, just the fact that we do this online anyway. So yeah, that always works out. You know, bully for us, but <laughs> <laughs> yay, Corona. So yeah. 
sucks for a lot of other people doing shows and everything else. But hey, before we get too far out of the weeds, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? You want us to introduce you? I'm happy to. Yeah, I was just actually just going to ask if we started yet or if we, if we just <laughs> yeah. warming we'll, up. Or what's I just didn't record. Yeah, and we'll just find a place to jump. Yeah, in. we don't we yeah. don't do this live or anything, so we'll edit, edit it, make us sound cool and smart. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm Jem, and I play drums in Dead, and I run our record label, and um, that's mainly what I do. That's of that's of interest, I'm guessing, to this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. yeah, sounds like we were already starting kind of in some other interesting conversation areas. We'll have to think on it as your dad would yeah. Yeah. suggest. <laughs> Go take a train ride. Depends on what your kinks are. <laughs> Might get into that. You never know. Well, welcome. Yeah, thank you. And so Missouri is actually, we've never been there. I don't know why, but we haven't made it there. So it's, <laughs> really? it's yeah. in the middle. It's definitely in the middle. Yeah, I think we've tended to go like in a ring, I think, you know, usually mm-hmm. when we go to the US. So we've, we've never played like uh, Kansas or yeah. Nevada. Just a few that I'm like, oh, I know those. Na-. You know, we've never played iowa even but we've played south dakota so (laughs) so yeah you're getting closer to canada with like the dakotas and you're getting up towards i guess if you're doing a ring toward the top yeah i don't know i mean it's just it's such a big place and we can't if if we could i'd just go over there for like three months you know and just just absolutely go everywhere but Sure. Gotta go home. You gotta hit the you gotta hit the big gets. I mean, yeah, you gotta hit the coastal cities and, and things like that. That's where you know, that's everything was formed there in America. And well, you know, Australia is set up, I guess, in a lot of the same ways where it's, it's coastal. All, it's yeah. all coastal and everything in the middle is Yeah, very much. Know, how often do you hit the middle of Australia? Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we we've played there once or twice because it's I mean, to drive, we're actually, it's obviously it's off now, but we were due to play a metal festival right in the center of Australia. Oh, wow. So they, they call it Blacken, you know, like, um, so. They, like kinda, oh. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but I looked it up because th- they offered us the show and it's been years since we'd been there and it's a big undertaking that they do. And basically the money they were offering us wasn't, really going to cover the flights but the problem here is well there's there's nowhere else like it's not like i guess almost anywhere in the u.s except for maybe alaska you could say well we'll do something else on the way or on the way back and um, yeah yeah, i looked it up and it was going to take us three days of driving (laughs) you know and and that's without going through another city you know and Fuck. then when you that's hard to fathom yeah and then when you get there you just you're in the middle of the desert in a city of i should look it up but it's not a big city like it's i'm talking maybe i don't know maybe fifty thousand or something people like it's it's, yeah. it's a small city yeah we don't i i would love to hit that there are bands that can do it if if they're more accessible you know like to, to a mm-hmm. to a wider range of audiences that they do go they go pretty rural right and they particularly if they can get like a government grant or something to go into remote areas. But it's just for us, that's been, that's been something that's always been a problem with our band is that ethically and the way we approach things like that, that would be, that would mean everything to us. Yeah. But people see us and hear us and think, Oh no, 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 that's not, that's too extreme. That's not, mm-hmm. you know, that's not something that the people want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, tastes evolve. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. Like, I remember being a kid and, you know, Metallica was so extreme <laughs> when I was a teenager. And now it's just like, oh, yeah, it's just Metallica. Well, it's, you it's, know? Pr- it's, it's dad rock almost now. Right. You know? yeah, yeah, it is. It's not almost. It is dad rock <laughs> now. Oh, yeah. Well, and even some of those bands going back like Testament or like, uh, Mm-hmm. You know, um, kick axe or some of those that were like, oh, they were underground or whatever at the time, or, or even Slayer. And now it's like, hmm, yeah, kind of, uh, you know, at least the, the newer stuff, kind of pedestrian. <laughs> it's like, wow. Well, really? I remember, you know, and this yeah. dates me, but I remember when ACDC was hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and now it's played at wedding receptions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. 
I suppose it's just what becomes familiar, isn't it? And then people aren't scared of it anymore. Right. Yeah, I can remember actually telling Matt at one point that ACDC was much more progressive in uh, Missouri than it was in Illinois because I grew up in Illinois because Bon Scott would wear a dress. So it was like, you know, they, there was this automatic homophobia <laughs> up there. It's like, mm-hmm. mm, I don't know about them cross-dressing boys, you know. Of course, yeah. they listen to the guys with long hair and makeup and fishnets, but <laughs> don't wear a skirt, Yeah, whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the one thing about America is if you're, you should play the Midwest and here's why kids here are star for music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> I mean, our, our favorite, and we're not joking when we say this, like our, I shouldn't say it's favorite necessarily, but we, every time we come to the U S we have to do North Dakota and Montana. And like, that's mm-hmm. not, that, that's not, you know, we've done tours where we've ended up, um, we toured from LA across to Miami with House of Lightning, the some of the dudes from Torch. Okay. And and we were like, that's cool, but we gotta get out at Miami and fly to the Midwest because we have to get to Fargo and Grand Forks. And they're sort of <laughs> looking at us going, What? Okay, you know, that's we've got people there and we have to it ju- we just resonate. I honestly and there's something about I suppose because we're a very underground band Mm -hmm. if we if we do a good show in a bigger city like seattle or portland or something that's great it's like it's really good Mm -hmm. but you know if you do a smaller show like the last time we played la you come out of it and you go okay we lost money the venue were really horrible to us you know you didn't connect or anything whereas you can play in bismarck south dakota to the same amount of people and it feels really, really good, and you know that. Yep, we're making plans to come back. Right. It's just, we've we've never been. I don't know. People seem to have this thing like, oh, chase the big cities or something, but we've never ever taken that approach. No, John and I have talked about it several times. Just we we lived in a smaller market in our college days, and you know when they would bring in bands when they would come in fans would just go extra crazy, yep. you know, just to have it because we didn't have that. Yeah. So when it did come, there was like a real appreciation for it. Yeah. You know, and you know, if you're in LA or New York or something like that, they get all the time. Everybody's coming through all the time Yeah. and you can just pick whatever you want at a given night and you're spoiled. Yep. Honestly. Yeah. Honestly, you're spoiled. But also I think another part of it that people tend not like sometimes people say, oh, yeah, go to the small towns and they're just starved for it and they're going to, you know, they, they lap it up. And they almost sometimes that I guess that that's true, but they almost make it sound like, oh, these people are desperate. So, yeah, OK, whatever they can. But I actually think the other side of it that people don't talk about so much is mm-hmm. when you go to, you know, New York. People don't have the attention span to, like, comprehend. I mean, I'm making, mm. making it sound like our music is crazy and out there, but unless they've been told, you know, if people have been told, hey, son, are cool, mm. then they will sit through a 90-minute, you know, two-chord um, piece because they've already, right. like, they've, been, they've been told it's huh. cool. But if they haven't, like, we, we just find you go to a place, you know, Minot, North Dakota, the people that are at a show, they're all freaks. So they're not looking, they're not looking at us weird because, oh, geez, these guys are a bit different. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we played, last time I played in Minot, North Dakota, one of the bands on the bill, the oldest member was 10. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were a punk band. And I guess what I'm getting at is I think when you're outside of a bigger, busy city, you maybe have just that little bit more patience and that little bit more attention span to take something in like a band like ours that might not make sense within the first 30 seconds you know it's not like a Mm -hmm. it seems like these days as well as more and more like okay you're a sleep band you're a turbo negro style band you're a you know you're you're the stooges version 7.0 or you know but if you're not that it's a lot harder to grab people's attention. Right. And one thing that I find that's a little bit of a nuance on that, just being somebody who grew up in Illinois, Illinois has a wide range from just country to city, you know, when you're talking Chicago, but going into Chicago and seeing shows, I can just say as a fan, there's a lot of anxiety to that. 
Yes. And, yeah. you know, you got everything going on around you. It's like, oh, is this a sketchy neighborhood? Is it not a sketchy neighborhood? Where am I going? What, you know, mm-hmm. um, am I going to get robbed going into this venue? Am I not? Especially when you're looking at punk shows and, and, and shit like that. And you get there, by the time you do, you've lost a lot of energy, man. Yeah. <laughs> and then <and, and> you're <laughs> thinking about going home <laughs> at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, and getting out of there. Yeah. In the meantime, you can, yeah, in some ways you, yeah, you're right. right. Your focus can barely hang on. Right. <laughs> it's hard to slam when you're worried about how am I going to safely get back to the car after <laughs> <Right>. this? <laughs> it's part of it <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So what was your scene like, I guess, growing up, Jim? Cause you know, John and I hear a lot of stories about coming up, stateside i'm wondering if there's like differences yeah i mean if it's kind of a universal experience there would have to be differences i started playing music this is actually you know because of all this lockdown this is the longest break from playing live shows i've had since i played my first live show at 13 years old wow i don't know what the longest i would have gone is but i mean Maybe two months is the longest I've ever gone. Huh. And this is really long because we kind of took a bit of a break. We, we were due to start a tour like just as the pandemic hit. And we took a bit of a break before that to sort of keep writing and do other stuff. So, but I started, I'm just trying to think, I would have played my first live gig in around 99, no, yeah, 99 or 2000, maybe. <clears throat> And that, that, so that's when I was a, in early high school. Mm-hmm. And I would say it's different to what I normally hear because I normally hear about, particularly people that make the sort of music we make, people hear about some sort of a punk scene, some kind of a DIY scene, like an all ages thing. And uh-huh. that where I grew up, I grew up in Melbourne, like a, a large city here. Mm-hmm. That was, there was none of that. And actually the laws were really, really restrictive. So I grew up knowing that people older than me had gone to all ages shows and seen bands like Nirvana and, you know, bands of that era. (sighs) But that was all over. And um, when I was a kid, it was actually illegal to, in a licensed venue, have an all ages show. So you could have an under 18s show or an over 18s show but not both. So you couldn't even take your own daughter to a show. And to to give you an example, I saw Mr. Bungle when I was 14. They did a a national tour and they only did one under 18 show in the whole of the country. And it happened to be, happened to be actually in a venue that I had a regular gig at. So I didn't even have to pay. They they put me on the door. (laughs) But they played an afternoon show under 18s. And there was maybe 120 of us max in a like 800 person venue. Huh. And the, the show that night was sold out weeks in advance and no one could get in. And people were trying to pretend they were under 18 <laughs> to try and get in. Sure. And so it was just, it was so absurd. And so my experience was I played live music at least two nights a week for five years before any of my school friends were allowed to come and watch. Hmm. And I would carry around a piece of paper that explained my legal rights that I was allowed to play a show there because I, the first show I ever played, I literally got picked up by a security guard and thrown out of the venue. And um, I had to stand there on the street waiting for other people to pack up my gear because they wouldn't let me back in. Wow. So it was this really strange experience because I grew up for years the only shows that I could see were the shows that I played huh. or unless I went to like a stadium show and, you know, like my dad took me to see Deep Purple and, yeah. I, um, you know, I bought a ticket to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers just because I, I just needed to see fucking something. Right. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, that meant that wins were few and far between. I mean, I was so, so lucky that when I was around 16, we all um, went and saw Tool uh, you know, mm. me and a bunch of friends, and the Melvins were the fucking support band. Nice. Yeah. And it literally, like, like it changed my life. It was so, I just was like, I, I didn't know that anything happening now would excite me this much because I grew up, you know, obsessed with Hendrix and King Crimson and mm-hmm. Pink Floyd and, and all this stuff from the past, but I wasn't, it was the first time I was like watching something happen now. 
So, yeah, as, as far as what the scene was like, I basically grew up playing um, music that I would describe as more uh, more so than what you would hear in Dead, more influenced by people like Bill Withers, yeah. Funkadelic, yeah. Uh, War. Radio rock. Um, yeah. Yeah, and more sort of groove-based music. Mm -hmm. And so I always played original music. I've never played covers or in a cover band or anything like that. But uh, we would – I was lucky that my bandmates were all six years older or more than me. So they were were a bit more accomplished and a bit more confident as human beings. Right. But we mainly played shows where we would play like two or three sets a night and it was a lot of just improvising and – I, I just didn't really have a scene to belong yeah. to. I didn't, I wasn't. And so by the time I discovered that there was a thing called DIY punk, I'd already self-released several albums. I was already printing all my <laughs> I, own posters. I, you know, yeah. I just, it it just seemed really absurd to me. And, and the DIY thing, which I realized I would fit into, huh. but I didn't have the, I didn't wear the right clothes or, you know, I would like, mm-hmm. And and also, I guess the other thing is, I, a lot of people have that punk awakening of, oh, you know, that's um, that's music that I could see myself being able to play because it's simple. You know, it's just three chords. I just, I really came at it the opposite way. I, twelve years old, started playing drums, listened to Deep Purple, and just said, "That's what I'm going to try and do." Right on. <laughs> and obvious, obviously, I couldn't do it, and I still can't play like that guy. Mm-hmm. But I never ever said to myself. Oh, I'll just play like a whole song or a, you know, Green Day song or right. something because that's really simple. I I still to this day struggle to play verse chorus stuff. Like I've learned how to do that through playing with Jace in Dead, mm-hmm. but it's it's still almost to me to write a song like that, which we do sometimes. But that doesn't seem like the normal way to me. Like the normal way to me was you know, let's write a 40 minute song mm-hmm. with, you know, 35 different changes. And <laughs> right. Well, it may be your yeah. like, but it's not coming from you. Yeah. So that's, uh, it's probably part, of it. you know, I was in a band for a little while. It's kind of how we felt about covers. It was just like, it's not coming from us. It just doesn't feel genuine. It doesn't feel like what we want to do. And I don't know. I, I felt like it was a little easier to do, you know, originals. Absolutely. I'm the, I'm the same. Like, yeah, I get you on that. Yeah. yeah, where did the so where did the ideology come from with the law? Is it was it just going to like separate the drink and like make kids make sure kids weren't like um, in a bar room atmosphere or where, where did that come? Because yeah. bungle certainly not safe for kids. <laughs> you know? oh, okay, so the- I was trying to imagine yeah. like what is a tamed down yeah, what, bungle what show like? Tamed- What's one that's appropriate age? <laughs> no, well the the reason that happened um, mm-hmm. and and the reason it happens so rarely oh, and get this. I mean, 14 years old, and the support act was Neil Hamburger. Right. <laughs> I, and he mainly coughed the entire right. time. <laughs> well, what else? And I, I just remember thinking, this this is the most infuriating human being I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. And um, I'm actually really, really grateful because then I saw him again and he was a little more popular. Uh. And then I saw him again and he was so popular that, only then did I realize this guy's a fucking genius. Right. And he used to just, you know, his thing had to be, well, everyone, everyone hates me and everyone's going to hate me. But seeing him in a room full of people where everyone loved him, I realized this guy's actually incredible. Yeah. And not just, you know, I'm going to piss people off. Once somebody explained it to me as anti humor, then I got it. <laughs> and then he became really funny to me. But he's been on your label too with the uh, hard ons, right? Yeah. And he's done, he's done stuff with them before. Like he recorded vocals um, on a track with them. And, and they're, they're definitely good friends. You know, I, I have to say, like the few bands I've worked with or artists that are, you know, bigger, mm-hmm. they've all been really, really lovely to work with. I've never had anyone be a pain in the ass and and uh, greg is probably more so than ever super super professional and which i really appreciate because it's sort of the way i've always operated i've always operated as if i was a bigger deal than i am you know (laughs) same (laughs) but but i I guess just with professionalism you know like like i've never i don't know i've never turned up late to a show i've never played over my allotted time slot and stuff like that and right it's nice that when you deal with people who that's, you know, that's their life, be it, yeah, you know, 
Greg or Hardons or Melvins or whatever that they actually nine times out of ten they're more professional. <laughs> but but just to go back, the the reason that show happened, and I I, I knew this from back then because the venue they played was called the Corner Hotel, and that's actually you know the Melvins album uh, Alive at the Fucker Club. Uh-huh. That's the corner. Oh, okay. oh, cool. And that was the venue for about two years from when I was 13 to actually, no, longer. Anyway, for a long time, I played there like every week. So I had a residency in this band and we would play two two sets. And um, I've never been paid that well ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were really, really nice to me and they would feed me. And as long as I didn't, you know, I never, as long as I didn't drink a beer um, while they were open, yeah. And um, they were, they were always, my dad would come down and watch me play, and they were always really nice to him. So I learned a lot about what was happening behind the scenes. And the reason those under 18s shows ever happened was purely because the band would negotiate and say, We're going to give you a show. It's going to sell out. It's going to make you a lot of money. You have to give us an under 18s show because. You won't make any money off it. We get that because you can't sell beer, mm-hmm. but we will make money off the tickets and we will sell merch. And so sadly, Mr. Bungle was an anomaly because usually the bands that did that stuff were like, you know, early 2000s when I was in high school was <laughs> when awful ska, right. and awful pop punk, and then even worse, bands like, you know, Limp Biscuit and all that, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Those those were the bands that did under eighteen shows normally, so I had no interest. Right, but yeah, I don't know, and and it was really ridiculous because every weekend, you know, my friends, we would all just be in a park drinking because there was nothing else that we could do. Right, and occasionally there would be some sort of you know drug and alcohol free show where we could we could go and see a few bands, right. and we would just lap it up, you know, and, sure. And that it was like you couldn't be – this could not be more clear that if you just let the kids go to a show, you would stop them yeah. punching on right. in the park and Getting sniffing paint and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it meant the shows that we did see were weird. Like I, I saw Roland's band play at a university on a like Tuesday night mm-hmm. way out in the suburbs and it was where my dad um, worked and so he took us out there. Mm-hmm which ended up being this amazing room that I recorded an album in years later. But it was a really surreal experience because it was this huge room where you should have exams. You know, probably you could probably fit 800 people in there or more. Hmm. And I, I think there was maybe about 50 of us. And um, it was a tour that Roland's band were doing. All the other dates were with the Mark of Cain. I don't know if you guys know them over there, but they're, they're big here. Mm. Okay. Every show was a sellout, every show. I mean, so they were playing to 2,000 people a night, except for this night. <laughs> and, and I remember that Rollins came out on stage and just he just looked so like he'd, you know, um, just popped his yep. balloon. Like, mm-hmm. And it was actually pretty impressive, though, because I saw him freak out and then just deal with it and then just snap into another mode. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And it was it was cool, but you know, kind of turned on the persona and yeah, became Matt Rollins, yeah. And hmm. and you know, he probably had to access a memory like from twenty years ago. <laughs> Fuck, <laughs> you know, what, what, when was the last time I played to know? Yeah, what do I do with? Yeah, so to answer your question, yeah. uh, really slowly, there was not a scene, and I've never played in a band that resonated with any one scene enough to sort of say, oh, yeah, here's where we really fit it in. So Mm -hmm. once I started touring the country, which was like I think maybe a week after I got my license, so so you can get your license when you're 18 here. Mm -hmm. Um, So until then I had to rely on getting a lift or, you know, mums and dads or, you know, we would take the tram to a venue and carry whatever we could and borrow, you know, whatever else. Once we started touring, it was really interesting because – the cities here are generally around 10 hours drive apart Yeah, and they don't, I mean, they're probably crossover more now, but when we started touring, you know, the internet wasn't really a factor and I was still booking tours via the phone. And mm-hmm. so we would turn up to one city and I, I just remember this really clearly that in Sydney, we were part of the crust punk scene mm-hmm. because for whatever reason, they didn't care that we didn't dress like them and didn't sound like them. I think just a few people, early on sort of vouched for us and then they saw oh yeah these 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 are nice people they've got good politics whatever 
mm. but nowhere else were we <laughs> able to be. You know, if we tried to play a crust punk show in Melbourne, it was just like painful. So I don't know. Yeah, there, there wasn't really much of a scene and I learned to play by just playing shows and, you know, the only other bands I got to see were the bands playing before or after us, really. I guess I always had, in the band that I was in, I was probably the only member that liked the heavier stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we tended to, I mean, do, do you know the Pink Floyd song, Echoes? Yeah. I mean, we the, the first band I was in, we covered that for a while, just that was the sort of band it was. It was like, <laughs> right. you know what, fuck it, we'll just do that 25-minute song and we'll just do it our way. And, <laughs> you know, and, and again, right. because it was pre-internet, I mean, I was sometimes playing, just mentioned Bill Withers before, I was playing Bill Withers songs sometimes with them and mm-hmm. I'd never heard it. I didn't have a copy of the record. Huh. So, yeah, then later on in high school, I formed a band with two other bass players and that was sort of the beginning of, I reckon we formed that band a few months before we saw the Melvins and then we saw the Melvins and then that, you know, (laughs) kind of, it sort of just meant that things became, you know, before we saw the Melvins, we were probably a a King Crimson tribute band. Right. And then after we were still a King Crimson tribute band. Right. But it just became more important to turn the amps up more and, you know, you know, and hit as hard as we could and that sort of stuff. Like, Right, kind of like the AD, you're like PM post Melvins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I can't remember what I was trying to say now. I oh, just that, yeah, look, there just wasn't a scene. I've never played in a band that has really fit into a scene well enough. And, and honestly, I've never, that's never appealed to me anyway. I, I, I like as a school student, I hated, I loved all the friends and stuff at school, but I hated everything about like, oh, you have to fucking walk when this bell goes off. You right. have to, yeah. you know, line up and, you know, I hated, I, I've always gravitated away from a crowd mm-hmm. as a general rule. <laughs> of, and I don't say that like, geez, I'm, I'm, I'm so clever. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean it like that. Like, like. And I'd, I'd never really understood until many, many years later. For me, I think music is so important to me that I never was paying attention to anything else going on around it. Mm-hmm. I, I could happily stand there in an empty pub on a Thursday night and everything about where you are is a downer, except the band playing are amazing. That's yeah. That's all that I ever cared about, and it was – a long time into music that I realized, ah, oh, some of the people actually come because they want to socialize or they want to right. feel like they belong right. somewhere or, or all of that stuff. But for me, the belonging was right. like inside the music, you know? So are you like me? My wife does not understand this about me. Like if there's a show coming into town and I want to go and she's like, I, I don't really, I'm not interested in seeing that. I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. You don't have to come. I am just fine being there by myself. And yeah. she's like, oh, he's wanting to pick up women. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just don't want somebody talking to me while I'm trying to listen to the band. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I would I would generally prefer it. And, uh, I mean, me and Jace, my bandmate, we will watch bands a lot together. And we kind of know how to do it. Yeah, you know, so mm-hmm. so like we just just give each other a look that we're enjoying it, but we would never fucking yell in each other's ear, you know, how good's this solo? You know, like <laughs> well, just, that's that's yeah. an important thing to clarify, and I want to clarify for listeners, Dead, especially if you've been listening, two piece act, right? Yes, yeah. amazing amount of sound that comes out of you guys. It really is. It's impressive. There's a lot of two P and I, I love a two piece act, especially, but a lot of them that I've listened to in a lot of ways you're talking about, like the pack AD, um, flat duo jets, uh, white stripes, a lot of blues, you know, type stuff that, be, but the kind of progressive stuff that you're doing, um, is, is really amazing for that fact. But do you think, do you think that's part of it? Why you kind of gravitated and stayed with the two piece act is just that it's, it's more minimal for you. It's easier for you to kind of wrap your, brain around or yeah well i can sort of give you a little bit of a trajectory for that like Mm -hmm. the way that it panned out was i um i was very very lucky that within a few months of picking up drumsticks 
Uh, look, I was never a good student, but I had a teacher in the early days, uh-huh. and he um, is a good friend still to this day, and a family friend, a friend of my dad's. Uh-huh. And he would agree that I was a terrible student. <laughs> but what he gave me, which I oh, he gave me a lot, but one thing that he said that really, really helped, and I, I always say this to anyone, particularly if they're trying to teach a kid an instrument, he just said, as long as you keep moving your hands, that's something. Like, <laughs> I get, you know, he, he understood from the beginning, look, you're not good at following the rules. You're not good at doing homework if I give, give it to you. But what you are good at is picking things up really quickly. So <laughs> I was 12 years old. My brother was older than me, and he'd already finished high school, and he would have these weekly kind of, jams really like just with a group of friends Uh and just whoever turned up and yeah uh slowly i just began you know sitting in and i I wasn't even really tall enough to play the drum kit properly but and people were just really you know thankful that oh here's a drummer that can keep a beat you know Mm -hmm. and that's sort of all i needed to do and i wasn't trying to be the fanciest player ever and very early on, I learned, because I was always playing in larger groups of people, like maybe six or seven, I learned that, oh, the bass player is the one that, you know, we're sort of a team, aren't we? Right. We would kind of, you know, when they were having a break to smoke a joint or whatever, we would sort of, mm-hmm. you know, go and play a little game together and, and talk about, you know, what do we want to get out of this? And, and my, my first, it sounds like wives, my first bass player... <laughs> is still a really dear friend of mine and I essentially learned how to play, you know, through playing with him. And so what we would do is sometimes we would turn up to a band rehearsal and no one else turned up, you know, and so we would just play for a few hours and and we would often write music beginning, you know, with just the two of us and then tell the rest of the band, hey, this is what, you know, everything was written around a bass line. Mm -hmm. So I was always really comfortable with that and and then that, that band, my first band, there was six of us and then at one point, only three of us were willing to do these ridiculous. We had these shows that we'd organised where we had to play from three till six a.m. <laughs> we'd finish the show and then I'd wait for the first tram of the day to take me back home to the suburbs to get to my mum's house. Oh yeah, and so an hour. and so that <laughs> yeah, and so so one of the that six piece band split up into a band of three, and that was me, the bass player, and the harmonica player. Right. And that harmonica player would drink a lot, and uh, and when I say harmonica, you're probably thinking of like the blues and stuff. But he mm-hmm. he would play with a lot of distortion, and um, he was essentially like a kind of feedback guitarist. No, but he, he would mm, yeah. yeah he would often sort of wander off for half an hour and go outside and have a cigarette or right. something, and the two of us would just keep playing. And then yeah, and then I played um, that band in high school, Fire Witch, there was three of us, me and two bass players, but then one of them decided he, he needed to go and become a firefighter for a while. Yeah. And so the two of us continued as a two-piece, and I had another drum and bass two-piece with just this woman, Elise, on bass, where she played a bass guitar, but she doesn't play it in any kind of conventional manner. So that was just pure. Oh. We would go on tour just playing pure you know, improv, like just just messed up noise Mm -hmm. so by the time dead came around as a possibility dead was yet again we were originally a three-piece um jace played guitar we had another guy mikey on bass and it was a different band i should say sorry we were called fangs of okay but again like what, what always happens i guess that the problem with us is you know we're very ambitious but we live at the arse end of the world and <laughs> right. there aren't any bands for the last 20 years doing anything like us here that have made a career out of it. <laughs> yeah, eventually Mikey from our other band, he just he wasn't up for what we were doing, which is totally fair enough that you know <laughs> driving driving 10 hours, getting abused by the um venue, you know, losing money, sleeping on the side of the road. Like it just wasn't worth it to him. And so we basically decided let's just do something with the two of us and whoever else wants to play at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, you know, more a matter of a pragmatic thing that it started that way. But I just just to go back to that band where I played with Elise, mm-hmm. she taught me a lot about I because I'd grown up playing in a six piece, I remember at one point saying to her Oh, it feels a bit strange playing with just one person, you know, like yeah. I'm used to have it having a lot. And she sort of said, 
Oh, I think even two can be too many. Uh, yeah. And that just really stuck with me. And I realized, wow, there's a lot that we can do with only two of us that we can only do with two of us, you know, like, right. So that's, that's what we're excited by. We go, well, this is what we have. Like we have two people right? and it gives us, there's a whole lot of things that we can't do, you know, so we can't play like a Fugazi song. We can't, you know, right. play like a, a Pink Floyd song. We can't do that sort of gentle layers of, you know, we did some touring with that band Black Cobra mm-hmm. and they really were a good influence for, they exploit the fact that they can kind of change direction really quickly and they mess with tempo a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, that's something that you can't do with three. And it's also just like an intimacy thing. Like, Yeah. Well, I was going to say particularly with like sound or with just with songwriting, that's got to be more in tune because I've been through a similar situation where I was in you know three piece band for a little bit, but but our drummer and it wasn't like he was a flake or anything. He just had to work a lot. Mm. So it was me and the guitarist as a vocalist, and me, but working out the songs and writing the songs was just a lot more simplified when it was just me and him and just two minds connecting. Yeah, and then we could relate to him and say you know lay this beat on. So I mean, you think that was the case? You think that also helps with uh, laying out the tracks? Oh uh, yeah, and it, it just the efficiency is. Mm-hmm. Uh, like phenomenally, there's a few things, you know, worth saying for starters, we just are very ambitious. And so it's not fair to expect anyone else to want to move ahead at the pace that we do. Right. But there's also something Jace made a solo record not that long ago, just, you know, like an acoustic, you know, solo record. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. And what he did was sometimes say you've got a three piece or even a four piece, Hmm. you know everything might be fine and working well in the beginning but then as things evolve i don't know maybe you have one member that is leaning more towards you know heavier stuff and another's more towards like right and you end up with two possibilities i guess you end up with tension and then people not cooperating Hmm. or you end up with in a way what's just as bad which is an agreed upon sort of sound Mm-hmm. And then and then you can't evolve as much. Whereas with us, things are really quick. Like, do you like this riff? No. Cool. <laughs> right. Like, whereas, you know, if you've got three, do you like this riff? Yeah, I love it. Do you like this? No. Oh, shit. You know, like, so we can make decisions really quickly and we both often have, we always have about three or four records in our brains, you know, that, that are not finished, but we kind of know what we're doing with them. Mm -hmm. And we work that way. We both have those ideas, you know, in our head. And I I guess they can just be, it's it's an efficiency thing, but it's also, I mean, I feel really privileged, like, like to the point of guilt at times. It's like, fuck, we can just, you know, we, we've had other members on some records. We we did one record with a third member for the whole album. Ah. The way we approached it was we just said to him, We've written the songs. We've left space for you. Mm. You do whatever you want, and that's the end of your contract. You don't owe us anything after that. If you want to come on tour with us, we will book a tour that suits this music. Yeah. And if you don't, we won't be angry. With, you know, like, can you commit to this? And and same with, um, you know, when we come back to the States, we will tour with our friend Vern, who plays synths, uh-huh. and we'll write a set that suits having her in the band and we'll, we'll work something out where she'll probably do like a set of her own and then we'll do a set as a two piece and then we'll do a set as three or something like that. But it's at, then when it's time to go home, we don't have to fire her you know, because right. it's just, <laughs> it's just a little it's already agreed like, upon. Yeah. It's an agreed upon project. And that means that we can keep moving ahead so we can, we can be working on stuff. Yeah. With a third member while we're working on other stuff. That's just the two of us and, yeah, and it's it's also just re- massively challenging, yeah. which is exciting as a player because when when we're on stage, we don't have the option of geez, I kind of need to just stop and have a quick breather because right. it's really obvious if one of you stops. So, well, it, it makes me think of another question. I just listened to a lot of your stuff today, and I was just tracking a lot of it. You know, like listening to raving, drooling versus listening to idiots, or or listening to thunder, or listening to these albums. Like, there's kind of a unified sound. That's on it. Mm-hmm. But is it kind of an intentional, like we're aiming for this sound on this record, or is it just that that's what you're feeling at the time and that's kind of what you put together? 
because they're, I mean, they, they can sound definitely very different. I mean, they're all great, but what do you think about that? Yeah, do you yeah. think it's like intentionally thematic for you guys, or is it? Uh... The first three albums, so that's um, Thunder, Idiots, and then Captains of Industry, mm-hmm. they were all recorded primarily as just playing the songs as we'd written them to play live. So, that mm. I mean, I, I booked a tour for Dead before we had written a song, and that was like indicative of the times we live in where mm-hmm. no one needs demos anymore. So all I did was emailed everyone around the country saying, hey, it's Jem, you know, I've got another band, you know, let's play a show. Yeah, cool, done. And then I came back to Jason and said, all right, we've got a month to write a set. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that doesn't, that's not a problem for him. That guy just, you give him a couple of hours and he'll write a few songs, you know. Mm. So Thunder, we recorded, I think we'd played a, a small handful of shows. We had two days in the studio and we knew that Josh at Wantage USA was going to release it and we knew that we were going to tour the States. And, you know, we sort of had a plan. Mm -hmm. But basically all all we could do was just just kind of lay it down live. Mm -hmm. And then we had a few little ideas of things we wanted to do in the studio. Right. And then same with Idiots. It was pretty much just practice the songs, play them them in the studio. And then Captains of Industry was – very much like we just finished a US tour and then went into the studio. So those were probably, we weren't thinking too much. Yeah, I think we just felt this sort of urgency I did of like, keep being productive. You wanted to translate live. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. But once we'd done them, I kind of sort of stopped and gathered my breath. Uh And what I do now, Jace is the primary songwriter Mm -hmm. and without him it would take a lot longer to write songs because the way i've always written songs is just improvise for hours on end and pick out the bits that are good Mm -hmm. and then piece them together into some sort of bit of music like it's very much that kind of king crimson style yeah but jace is a bit more methodical Mm -hmm. so what i will tend to do is we sort of split up the roles and, you know, because this is the area where I get to be more creative. He's kind of written the bulk of the song. And then when we go to record, I usually do the production. So I, I usually oh, okay. am the person yeah. kind of doing the mixing with the engineer. Mm-hmm. And what the other thing I tend to do is sort of tell Jace, oh, this is what I'm thinking. Like this song is kind of forming like a metal record, you know, metal in our world. You know, we kind of have these because we're not specifically trying, we're not trying to do like a specific genre, but there's sort of an energy. So when when we did the trilogy, we knew that, okay, one of those records will be with that third member. We're going to write stuff that is deliberately to exploit what he's good at. Uh So his name's BJ Morizonkel and he plays like as a solo, like as a one man band, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was the first record we did where Jace just played bass lines. Like we just played, as a kind of rhythm section, knowing that, okay, there's going to be a third member. So now there is more of a deliberate approach, but I'm just trying to explain how we do it so that I'm accurate. Sure. So raving drooling, for example, Uh there's a few things that we kept saying to each other. In the beginning, it was like, let's make a record that is our ACDC record, our Motorhead record, our Unsane record. Sure. Bands that just kind of pummel you from the start to the beginning and Mm -hmm. because you know we've got a tendency to have these like atmospheric intros or you know oh yeah remorse shows that right out of the gate i think it's like yeah yes very good hook right and then we also i don't know then just somewhere along the way we went but then it's gonna fucking really change once you flip the record over right (laughs) so side b's (laughs) and the other thing that it is like a tribute to in a way is the pink floyd album animals Mm. But I mean that in a very um, non-specific way, but it's something about when we're making a record, I have colors in my mind and I have moods in my mind. And as we get towards them, I just know, yep, that's that's where we're at. And for some reason, I just said to Jace, the front cover of Pink Floyd Animals, I just want to make an album that kind of invokes the mood that that did as a kid when I looked at it. You know, I looked yeah. at it and I went, oh, God. Mm. That's scary. And, and then as I got older, I just, I've always resonated with Roger Waters, mm-hmm. like intense cynicism, you know, like, right. mm-hmm. and uh, 
it's a funny record in a way because we we tracked it a long time ago. I can't remember now. Right. And we sort of almost forgot about it and hadn't finished it. Yeah. Just life got in the way. But yeah, I try and balance that stuff. I don't I don't want to make sometimes um a band will they sort of have like a habit of ah oh, their albums usually have a quiet song and a a long song and a right. Mm-hmm. A formula, yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 strange because the album itself is diverse. Mm-hmm. But the approach to the album is the same as the last album and the one before. Right. So I just try and find a balance with that. I sort of think, well, let's make the albums more deliberate. So at the moment we're working on the next record to come out is a pop record and we've recorded almost all of it. Mm. And they're all short songs. They're all, well, they all would fit on a 45. Mm. And the melody and the vocals is the kind of the main driving force. And we're working on another record that is, kind of a cliche i know but the old like soundtrack sort of film like you know yeah mm-hmm. and that that one will probably have you know no no vocals i'm imagining so far it doesn't right you know there's no rules as such right uh, it, we just like to play games you know and that, that's the game yeah not necessarily thematic but maybe just emotionally driven that you're, you're thinking about the record as the record as a record rather than just song by song and throwing them together on a yeah, and this is what I was trying to say before. It's taken me forever to get there. Is <laughs> it's about it's about the process, not about the end product. So we're not yeah. we're not heading towards okay. It has to sound a particular way, right? You know, we went into that studio when we made Raving Drooling. The engineer is uh, he plays in a very very heavy band called Ilva. He records for the Cosmic Psychos, and we know that he can capture brutal sounds. You know? yeah. So we deliberately used him, and we just yeah, we just had that energy of it, like, hey, this is going to be our take on a kind of unsane record, knowing that it's not going to be like that at all. Right. That's just the approach that we take. But the end product could be anything, and and indeed it was. Like all of a sudden, we're like, oh shit, there's a 13 minute song. On our tribute to Motorhead, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But um, no, it's a great fucking record, man. It's it's just where it went, you know. Yeah, no, it's great. I highly recommend it, man. It's a really good one, Matt. I feel like I've been rogering with questions. Do you have something to add? <laughs> I did have an analogy for the uh, <laughs> the whole bands kind of having the theme thing. You know, you ever read like Dan Brown books? Oh no, I haven't. Uh, Angels and Demons and um, Da Vinci Code. Oh, yeah, like you yeah, okay. read the books, it's like. Every one of them is the same book. They've just got slightly different twists. You yeah, know, okay. it's, it's all, okay, it's in Paris instead of Milan this time, you know, but it's the same story. Yeah, and, and who, like maybe that's enough to keep that writer occupied. Like mm-hmm. sometimes I think, you know, you, you take a band, I mean, Mr. Bungle are probably an exception because they're all very, very good musicians and very accomplished but Mm -hmm. sometimes you take a band like that and you think they're almost like got too short an attention span and and attacking too many different things at once yeah i just remember hearing a quote from lemmy and he genuinely believed that they'd never repeated themselves Hmm. and i thought Mm. i you know (laughs) i I know that members of acdc didn't think that about themselves like i know that they recognized that we keep doing the same thing but i thought well lemmy is He's exploring things, I guess, within that world that I'm not privy to. And I'm really interested in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't read the Da Vinci Code or that guy's book. But <laughs> some, sometimes he, he as a writer might say, you know, within this structure, I've, I want to explore other things and that's enough. And yeah. Or I made a shit ton of money off of the last one I yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to me, I've said this a lot, but to me, music is a language. So. Yeah. Absolutely. When I first got really obsessed with music, I was five years old and I didn't know how to play and I didn't have any aspiration that I would. (laughs) And I really was um, taken by music that was sort of popular with teenagers at the time because my brother was one, so or he was nearly one. So, you know, Nirvana and the Smashing Pumpkins and whatever it was that made it to Australia. Mm -hmm. And once I started playing drums... You can never hear music the same way once you can play an instrument, you know, because you hear it. I, I'm guessing a person that's not a musician or hasn't studied music much just hears a sound coming out of the speaker. Mm. 
But, you know, once you're a musician and once you've made records or whatever, you hear everything. You hear the drop-in, you hear the bad tape cut, you hear Mm -hmm. the fact that that's double-tracked, like that is clearly double-tracked and all those things. Right. And so sometimes I think people will just blow something off and say, I mean, to me, most reggae sounds the same. It does. Yeah. Um, But I get it that if you're really into it, you must be hearing stuff that I don't hear that is enough to hold your interest. So I never know. Like, this is the weird thing about being in a band, as you guys know, the only people that can't hear your music the way everyone else can is you. Yeah. And you made it. (laughs) So. I don't know if our songs sound the same as the, as the song before it. I don't know if they sound really different. Like all I know is that it's enough to keep us, you know, interested. And yeah, I, I make a, a bit of an effort not to repeat myself too much. I, I was writing some lyrics the other day and I realized, Oh no, I've used, I've used that word before. Yeah. You know, maybe I shouldn't use that word. Mm-hmm. You've only got your own human condition. You've only got your own experiences. You've only got, you know, you're, you're kind of limited yeah. by yourself. And maybe that's where, in a lot of cases, the sound may come from on a record in a certain era. Here's the thing, too, that I'm interested in is going back to the DIY part and, and knowing that you were doing DIY before you knew what DIY was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You guys still, you know, you go international, you go all the way around the world. How does that work out for a DIY band in the fact that you don't have, you know, you didn't get picked up by some major label, you didn't get picked up? How do you find your girls in, like, Europe? When I started playing music, in a way, maybe I was um, at some sort of an advantage that I was so young that I didn't know, you know, I had no idea how young I was, but I also was not aware of the the cogs in the industry Uh you know because i'd never even really had a job besides like random jobs like cleaning up at music festivals or something or right so i didn't have much of a concept of how it all works i just knew that what i want to do is do this for my whole life i established early on like i i saw deep purple you know in one of their reformations right and it was in a tennis stadium and I was sat next to my dad and my brother, and I'm sure dad must have bought the ticket, and he knew that I was obsessed with this band. Mm-hmm. And I just had to contain my disappointment that this band were not as good as they once were. Mm. And also my disappointment that I'm sat in a fucking chair. <laughs> right. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kid. Look, looking down at them, literally. Looking down. Yeah, looking down. Yeah. And then not long after was seeing that Mr. Bungle show. Mm. And I remember reading an interview with Trevor Dunn mm. around the, like in the street press. And I remember him saying in the interview, the thing about us is that, you know, because we wear masks and because there's so many of us and all of that, most people don't know who we are. And, you know, he wrote in the interview, I've actually had, a lot of people at the bar after a show talk to me about how terrible Mr. Bungle were, right. you know, and I'll just, I'll just agree with them. A lot of these assholes, that was terrible. Yeah. God, yeah. yeah. Yep. That would be fun, though. I remember thinking, that's the career I want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want. I want to be touring, but not really in any sort of limelight. I just want, if these guys can pay the bills yeah. and not, play to thousands of people that's what i want and you know foolishly i thought oh that might be pretty achievable because um i'm not aiming to be flea or right billy joe from green day or whatever i just want to just do my job and right but the other thing that happened around that time is i guess so 2000 was when i put out my first record that was probably the you know the music industry had already started to crumble but it it was about to get a lot worse. You know? <laughs> right. Napster had already hit by then. Yeah. Yeah. So physical media was still was still the main thing. So that meant a record label still had for a little for a few years to come, and particularly the indie labels, they still had an incentive to say, Hey, let's like release music by this band and they might, you know, if we nourish them, they might Nurture them, sorry. Right. Uh, nourish them if we feed them. <laughs> if, we, if we nurture them, they might. <laughs> what happened for me in the beginning was we wanted to make a record. I was 13, 14 years old. <laughs> we had money in the bank, which is ridiculous, but we did because we were playing two shows a week and they were paying. <laughs> and 
we looked at what it cost to use a studio and because it was definitely still in the days before everyone had a laptop right. and could record. Oh, um, yeah. And we went and made probably the most expensive album I've ever made and it was on recorded on two-inch tape and mm-hmm. we spent, you know, a week or something making it. It was crazy. And then we just knew that the next thing we have to do is we have to press the CDs. Yeah. Like it, it never occurred to me that someone else might want to be involved and honestly – no one really ever has come knocking on my door, <laughs> yeah. ever. And and now it's sort of at the point where why would they? Because we're doing it ourselves anyway. Right. Well, I mean, with that youth too, you've got to be looking at the fact that you're not intimidated because you don't understand enough of what the, the world is like or anything else to be afraid, I guess. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I felt really, and, you know, I would have to say a lot of this comes down to having a an excellent older brother, having really supportive parents. Um, mm. They never, never told me that I shouldn't be doing this. Right. And it's not their world. You know, both my parents um, have university degrees and <laughs> um, successful careers and neither of their kids um, – went to university from an early age I'm, I'm still really small but i was a small kid the schoolyard was kind of scary because you just knew that mm-hmm. well, i can't i can't fucking defend myself yeah i'm not a fighter the few times i've been in some sort of fight i've just absolutely eaten shit right. and early on though i was 13 years old because my whole life I, I had long hair as a kid so everyone just assumed i was a girl mm. and uh i just realized oh, fuck when i'm on stage i'm i'm not scared of anyone like yeah. I realized when I'm on stage, I just, I've got my own little zone and maybe particularly being a drummer in a large band, you know, you were sort of, I was literally, you know, protected by the drum kit. Mm, that's a fortress. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and, and I was honestly very grateful for that because whenever people would jump on stage and try and sing or all that sort of stuff, <laughs> right. I, I didn't have to be the person to You're a hard target to grab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, um, Definitely felt yeah really confident in that sort of naive way and just sort of thought, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, like I said, I mean, I, there was one woman that tried to manage our first band uh-huh. and the bass player who was the manager of the band, that they sort of basically had a bit of a fight, so that didn't really work out. Uh-huh. And I thought, whatever, I, I don't really care. You know, in this industry, it's full of people that are trying to exploit you. Right. Like, and I never believed those people like Mm -hmm. when someone tries to sell me something even as young as you know six or seven i thought well what's in it for you like what why are you trying to convince me so a really young age you know for example the street press hey can you write an article on our band yeah if you take out an ad you know we can do it and i'd I'd say well if your street press is so good why don't you write the article first and we'll see if it's you know (laughs) right run it past me and Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then I would sometimes meet these people in real life, and they'll go, "What the fuck? Like, <laughs> that's a child." <laughs> like, Speaking um, of, we need to discuss your fee for coming. Oh, yeah, on that's here. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know the DIY thing. It just also be, it's that wanting to have control as well because it's a shitty feeling when you do what you can. So like early on. The first band I was in, the bass player, he learned how to screen print. So we screen printed all our own posters because that was cheaper than using the photocopy place. Mm -hmm. And we were young, so our time was worth nothing. So my job was, you know, put the paper in place and go and find somewhere for it to dry. And, you know, now I'm a screen printer and I, I... run a screen printing business it was also that feeling it's such a shitty feeling when you go uh there's an element to this that we can't do ourselves right i.e press press the cds the first cd we pressed we got the cds back Mm -hmm. and no one knows how this happened like they will never admit what happened but somehow in the middle of our album the spoken word of the chopper reed album just ended up on the audio fuck Chopper reads a Chopper reads a really famous criminal mm-hmm. um, from Australia that killed a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've I've seen the movie, but yeah, I know what you're talking. About. <laughs> yeah, and so that meant okay, we got to march in there, and they didn't want to do anything about it. They were like, oh, you know, and, it's fine. and you know, we just we just sort of said we're not leaving until you replace these CDs, you know. And so then, you know, all right, we'll do it. And it's that feeling that, like, look, other people don't care about this the way that we do, right? You know, so the more that we can do ourselves, the better it will be. And and when they do care, so Wantage USA, our label over there, 
Mm-hmm. And every every label that we've worked it with, we we had a, a label in the US called Eolian Empire that doesn't exist now, but they were great. And um, you know, you know it when they care, they care. Right. And then we love working with other people. Raving drooling was the first time. So the artwork was, as always, drawn by Jace, and I always do the layout. But we got a friend to do the coloring. So mm. all that color is because um, he's a comic book artist right on but we know him really well and he's the singer in the most devastatingly brutal band i've ever seen and we've toured together and we know you know we know that he cares we didn't know what he was going to do but we knew that he was going to care so that's why we a name drop for him uh so name drop for him his name is simon robbins and he plays in a band called piss bolt and originally before that a band called dad they broke me right on that both both just phenomenal bands yeah and so for us the going back to why would it be diy Mm. honestly i mean i remember being in high school or maybe just out of high school and me and my bandmate learning that the term diy existed and we both actually cracked up (laughs) because we were so and i get it that historically because you you know you've got to remember like I'm, i'm my bandmate jace is 12 years older than me fugazi all those bands i i get that they're from a really different place where diy was You know, that was hard work in the sense that, okay, you're trying to press a record and they make you pay up front. Mm -hmm. But all those things now are just how it is. So, you know, distribution, for example, physical distribution, like, was so important. But in in this day and age, it's... It's kind of how it is. Right. Yeah, it's less It's less so. Like, we, we mail order most of our records and, you know, and there's huge advantages to that because... Yeah. When we press a record and, you know, we, we know the names of the 300 people that are going to buy them, <laughs> you know? and mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess one of the bigger questions, though, is how do you find yourself on a plane to another country? Ah, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. again, again, that's um, not as hard as it used to be. The first country I toured to was Japan, mm-hmm. um, and that was because we had a bit of an exchange going on. Actually, through that guy, Simon, um, from Dad They Broke Me, they started it. Oh, Okay. We had a bit of an exchange program going on in the underground where they were sending extreme bands over from Japan and we were sending Uh people over there. And the cool thing about that was the two countries are so different and there's such a huge language barrier that Uh those tours consisted of the Japanese band telling us when their plane would arrive and when their plane would go home. Yeah. And us, us telling them, cool, we will fill every day with shows. You just turn up and, <laughs> right on. and vice versa, mm-hmm. you know, um, when we went to Japan. That's interesting. Yeah. And that was actually the easiest touring I've ever done because I didn't have to book the shows. Booking in the US was a lot more challenging because what I experienced, which I wasn't so prepared for, when when we went to Japan and when we went to Southeast Asia, people are really you know, there's a cultural exchange and they're really excited that you're coming and making the effort and they will go to lengths to meet you at the airport and put you on a bus to the next town and all that stuff. Right. And then (laughs) our experience of going to the US was, for the most part, no one gives a fuck who you are or where you're from. (laughs) Like, like this is a big place and, and a lot of people didn't know what Australia was. They didn't know that we were from another country. They just thought we were from Maine or some somewhere that they didn't, right? You know, know, know the accent <laughs> of. Right. Well, yeah. But the way it happened was through Josh Van Eck. Oh, actually, yeah. So Josh Van Eck runs um, the label Vantage USA. Mm-hmm. His brother Ian um, is in that band Japantha. Oh yeah, I fucking love Japantha. And their other brother. Matt is a lawyer that just happened to come to um, Australia in his, and these are his words, in his fake band called Night Toilet. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and great I don't know why they call themselves a fake band, but there, there are two lawyers that just booked tickets to the other side of the world and they, they toured New Zealand just, they had this really micro setup, right? Mm-hmm. Like just like they could carry in backpacks and they literally went hiking in New Zealand and camping and playing in the bush <laughs> where where so no awesome. one no one was around, you know, like <laughs> and then they played a show in my back garden and then we played a show together, dead, like when we just started. And they basically said to us, Hey, friends of ours 
are in a two-piece called Unstoppable Death Machines. Mm -hmm. They're from Brooklyn and they would definitely like to tour with you. So we sort of just contacted them and instantly, you know, we said, look, we're going to come over. We're going to be there for a month. What do you want to do? And they ended up saying, let's do the whole tour. And I have to say, I'm really grateful we did it. There were some absolute disasters and we endured experiences that I wouldn't wish upon anyone. And it was crazy because it was like two weeks before the tour was due to start. Yeah. The other band just just decided they didn't want to do it anymore. <sighs> I remember like, because I was working in a bar and I would finish work at 3 a.m. and then get home and um, work on the tour because that was sort of when it was a more like normal time for the U.S., Mm -hmm. And then I would sort of fall asleep and then wake up and then answer all the emails. And I remember just there was this email that just said, yeah, it's not really worth it. Mm. Can't get enough good shows. It's going to cost too much or something. So, you know, we're pulling the plug. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, my God, what the fuck are we going to do? And actually, Josh, our label guy, ended up just ringing them up and saying, like, pull your fucking head in. You know, <laughs> like, mm. these people are coming from the other side of the world and you've just like sorry like just yeah. suck it up so it was a really strange experience because we got in a very very small car with them and they were not happy about it and we were like okay we're going to drive an average of 10 hours a day for the next 30 days i think we did 34 shows in 31 days or something crazy yeah oh wow for the most part they really hated it <laughs> and um <laughs> to their credit to their credit, we still got to every show, but we learned early on there was a big difference between the two bands because they early on we were playing shows to two or three people and they just they didn't get it that we still played the same show whether the room was empty or not. Yeah, and um, we we were sort of like, well, this is what we're here to do, and mm -hmm. it was funny because there's strange things that they weren't vegetarian, but we are, and yeah. they they kept finding all the vegetarian places to eat everywhere we went. And, <laughs> The thing is, what they liked about touring was not playing shows to no one. What they liked about it was getting fucked up and having a party right. and yeah, you know, well, catching I up mean, with their friends. God, that's what I was going to say, just about yeah, age group and, and where you grew up and when you grew up. And I mean, just like to Matt and I, I uh, hate to speak for him, but like in our age group, looking at something like an international tour coming from the MTV generation. Yeah. You look at something like the Scorpions mm -hmm. playing to 800,000 people in Japan, you know, <laughs> right. and you're like, that's what an international tour is. And it's like, <laughs> no, it's fucking not. Right. Like, not at all. No, yeah. it's playing in a basement bar. Right. You know, but that's like 10 people. Yeah. You think like, well, why the fuck would you go to all the way to Japan if you're not doing that? You know? Yeah. So for us, it's real daunting to think about that, you know, audience, but. Right. I did see an Australian band on a U.S. tour that didn't usually go on U.S. tours. I saw a Powderfinger <laughs> playing just down the road yeah. in uh, Lawrence at the Bottleneck, which is not a big club. And how many people were there? Oh, it was maybe maybe 100 or so. I don't yep. think it was a huge uh -huh. crowd. So you have just given me the best. Like, this is what I was going to say. And I'm, I'm that's amazing that you have that experience because – Something that I observed early on in my in my career, I guess, in Australia was for the internet and stuff, you know, friends of ours, the hard-ons and, um, uh -huh. you know, I know bands like Radio Birdman and stuff, you know, they, they toured overseas. And back then it was very, very different because mm -hmm. they wouldn't have known what they were going into, right. you know, and they would have had to just make long distance telephone calls. And, and there's pros and cons. I mean, I... I tend to, rather than be a glass half empty or a glass half full person, just accept that the glass is there and that's like, it is what it is. So right. there are things about now that are incredible, you know, shows that I've booked in the US where someone has suggested, hey, you might like this band, Elephant Rifle from Nevada. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Within half an hour, we've sent each other a link to yeah, our album. Exactly. Yeah. We've established that we both like our, our bands mm -hmm. and we've kind of seen, oh, okay, you're both related to, we have mutual friends in, um, you know, Rabbits and Thrones and whoever. Cool. I, 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 yeah, let's do this. Uh, yeah, let's play a show. Um, and within an hour, you know, obviously, but then the flip side is that same person, not them, they were really, re really reliable, but sometimes that same person because it happened so easily, they just drop the ball just as easily. Yeah. But Powderfinger is a really good example, right? Because they over here 
are huge, phenomenally huge. Yeah, they're monstrous. And there's a few things that I learned early on. One is that in Australia, almost without fail, like, I mean, (laughs) ACDC are an exception to this, but almost without fail, you can either be big overseas and not so big here or big here and no one overseas cares. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is those bands, like Powderfinger, what happens for them is there's already not that many places to play in Australia. Then they sort of blow up to this thing that's so big that there's even less places for them to play. Right. Because they kind of (laughs) can't go. And it's not that they can't. Two of the same three towns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And honestly, I'm really cynical about them, those sorts of bands, because they always, it's not that they can't, Mm -hmm. it's that they won't. So Mm -hmm. the reason they can't is because, okay, they've got a huge entourage, they have a big production and all of that. And I just think, well, you know, learn how to be a real band again and go and play a small town. Are you familiar with Midnight Oil? Yeah. Yep. They were on MTV. Of course we are. (laughs) Yeah. And they are, for me and Jace, you know, that they're as good as it gets as far as a live band. Uh Uh-huh. And that's whenever I'm thinking to myself, ooh, maybe we're not, you know, making enough sound for two people. I think, you know what, they, the yeah. rhythm section of Midnight Oil can do more than this, so we can do more, you know. Like, <laughs> and I've, I've, yeah. Okay, so those bands like Powderfinger and stuff, what tends to happen with them is they get a bit of success over here, back at home. That means everything's changing. They've got crew, you know, they might have a sound engineer that they take on tour. They might have a manager that, you know, it starts to grow. And then they say, hey, we want to try and, you know, break into the European market. or the- Break the states. Yeah. yeah. And then they have to start from the bottom again and they don't know how. Right. And they don't have the, it's, it's not in them. And I've seen so many bands, I've got, I'm not going to name names because some of them are friends, but I know that they've been a big deal here and they just can't get the same thing to happen over there. Yeah. And I never wanted that to happen with us. And also I was acutely aware there is no single city in the world where dead can easily pull a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But across the world, because, you know, we've toured the US three times and toured here a lot, we've got a good, you know, number of people that know us and support us. So it's just kind of for us, that's the way that, we need if we want to connect with the people, we have to just go out there and you know go meet them again yeah, one by one. Got to cast a wider net. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing is, you know, we have friends that have had maybe a thirty-year career, and for five years their band paid the bills, uh-huh. and that's it. You know, and they haven't stopped, and we won't stop either. Mm-hmm. For us, yeah, you know, when we play to 100 people in Minneapolis, it's like, this is awesome. Right. And this is just as good as when we play to 100 people or less at home. I think some bands, they get, they become snobs. Yeah. They go, oh, well. Right. And I've just never understood the idea of who who cares. I don't care how many people we play to. I just, I just want to make the band sustainable. Right. And you're still trying to quantify art. Yes. And and that's something that it, it doesn't really add up. You know, what do they say? Dancing about architecture. Yeah. Or anything. Yeah. You know, it's it's the same sort of thing, putting a mathematical formula on success when it comes to something like what's driving you, what makes you feel good, and what kind of things that you generate. Because we're, we're thinking, too, about, like, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, Cordrazine and uh, – Mm. Hamish Cowan, you know, it's like in his story is a totally different story too. When you talk about breaking the stage, yeah, we had him on. He's he's a friend yeah, of ours, a good, a good friend of ours. But you know, it's interesting too with his story, with just kind of like, well, I'm kind of fucking done with this right now. <laughs> just kind of you know, credit after a while. <laughs> yeah, uh, right when they were getting ready to break. Little perspective for uh, the American audience yeah. that might not know, like Powderfinger, the album that I saw them touring on, that was like in 2000. Uh, in Australia, that record, I was just looking it up, is eight times platinum. Eight times. <laughs> right? So, like, huge, huge band in Australia. And if you live here, the Bottleneck, the club I saw them in, in Lawrence, isn't even the biggest club in town. No. Right? It's kind of a little bit of a legendary club. It's a really cool place, but the stage is what, maybe 15 by 20? Yeah. Definitely got cool points, but it's not an auditorium. And at that same time, I remember they were selling out venues of four or five thousand, and and then maybe two years later they were selling out fifteen thousand. Mm-hmm. And that's the, the thing about the industry here in Australia. And you know, I only know it from my perspective, and I've had very little 
interest in or involvement in the kind of the more mainstream side of things. Mm. And I mean, you know, I've never worked in a record store. I've never, um, right. Apart from, apart from being a roadie, Mm -hmm. you know, that's the, (laughs) Australia has this, like, it's a big place physically, but it's a small place, you know, small population. And it's, yeah, it has people that are, they were old when I was a kid and they're still the fucking gatekeeper of certain things. And there's this, yeah, there's this attitude of Australians in general. This is the other reason why we love touring the States. And I don't like admitting this fact, but Australians, when it comes to art and music, are so much more conservative than the US. Hmm. It feels so counterintuitive because, you know, we know that in the US there's some pretty extreme conservatism. <laughs> conservatism. But we have been treated by complete strangers, and I mean strangers that, that have nothing to do with the show, generally with so much less hostility in the US mm-hmm. than in our own country. And I've been like, I, I was woken up sleeping in the van in the middle of Yakima or something in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh no, you know, like, and it was just this, just this old guy that just wanted to check that I was okay. And uh, he said, you know, what are you doing? And I said, oh, you know, we're on tour. And he's like, oh yeah, my son's in a band. He's on tour t- uh, too. <laughs> right. And that's the other thing in the U S touring is more normal. Right. Whereas in Australia people, you know, cause we can't, we can't yeah. tour for a month or something. You're on what? So there's these you said he's on something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's these gatekeepers here, and th- those bands like Powderfinger and all of that, they end up mm-hmm. filtering through. Like, there's only so much room at the top, you know. Mm-hmm. And those bands kind of stake out their claim, and they right. they have certain sort of managers and whatever. And you know, I think Powderfinger were like at the time. I think that they were a decent band. Mm-hmm. And then what happened was they, they got big and then they just went, oh, let's keep repeating that formula. Sure. They know a guy from the Melvins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's always been this thing here where I've never been interested in playing that game. I've never been in a band that has any chance of being even bands that, you know, are celebrated like the birthday party or whatever. <sighs> they weren't at the time. You know, now it's safe to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I really like that. Mm hmm. Those sorts of bands, you know, Radio Birdman were never, they they had a hard time as as far as I know. It wasn't around, but, you know, from what I've heard, from what they've said. And so for us, it's like we actually, we have people just all over the world that are willing to go with us. Like we're not an easy band to necessarily follow. Right. We do stuff that's ridiculous. Oh, this is called the trilogy and there's four records. Right. (laughs) Here's an here's another T shirt without our fucking band name on it, you know, like, and all that sort of stuff. And for us, it's so when you get to a town and there's three of those people, or you get to a town and there's thirty, yeah, it's the same amount of special. Like, in fact, if anything, it's more when there's that smaller group because we think you're doing this despite the fact that it alienates you from everyone else like you're right you're kind of going out on a limb by embracing us like that this outs you as a weird person right. do you ever go to like a remote show and you see somebody wearing like a dead t-shirt and just like holy shit uh yeah i think i i'm just trying to think when that's happened but i mean we, we go to some really remote areas mm. uh, for australia anyway we play places that no one else is willing to play and the thing that changed more for me is i spent probably the first 10 years of playing live, being constantly having the power pulled, being told to turn down, being, mm. you know, told that that's sort of, you know, that's not music or asked to change what we do. Mm. That's the thing that we don't suffer now. So we kind of have a, if we're booking a show, it doesn't matter where it is with someone we don't know, I just send them like a text file that explains kind of the contract, uh-huh. you know, that this is, this is what we're going to do if there's a problem with it, you know, cause we're not, like rock stars so we're not gonna fucking we're not gonna trash anything we're just gonna we're just gonna play slightly challenging music for about half an hour right. <laughs> so once people meet us and know us they normally that's the crazy thing you, you go to these rural places where, where people are more conservative where people think of them as more conservative <laughs> but because we meet them and we say hello and shake their hand well, not at the moment but shake their hand before we uh play right they're actually more okay with it than people in the city. Sure. That say, oh, these guys are a bit weird. Right. 
how you become humanized. Yes. And that can be valuable. And look, and I know that from my mum's Indian and I'm half Indian. And I know that from I grew up learning that I have to let people know they don't need to be scared of me. You know, so if I don't make the first, you know, particularly after um, whoever it was um, that crashed into your buildings. Yeah. In 2001, it really did actually change. And I realized now I fucking look like I'm, I'm, I look like someone that people are scared of. So yeah, I'm, I'm used to the fact that it doesn't take a lot to just, just say hello. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I also realized at some point I was like, you know, all my favorite bands like Harvey Milk and the Melvins and Trans Am. And mm-hmm. every time I listen to a live set of them, they always say, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> like, isn't that nice? <laughs> yeah, that's really hard. Gosh. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. But a lot of bands don't do that. Yeah. You know? a, lot of, but, a lot of the pop stars aren't that polite. And yeah, I mean, that's one thing I find in, in America. I think even in middle America and rural America is the more that people are exposed to other races and the more people just meet people of other races, the less racist they become. I've kind of found, uh, I find yeah. the, I find the most racist areas are people where they just don't know anybody of any different race. Yeah. It's not, you know, well, you, if I almost put it into two camps because, <laughs> um, my mom's from Malaysia. That's got a lot of cultures like intermix. Mm-hmm. So you'll literally have like a Hindu temple next to a Sikh temple, you know, next to a Buddhist temple, like, like, and that's not exaggerating. Yeah. And I almost put into two camps. There's informed racists and ill-informed racists. Right. In Malaysia, plenty of people are racist. Mm-hmm. They're just not dicks about it. <laughs> right. And they, they understand <laughs> their racism. They're saying, no, I don't go to that restaurant because I know they don't wash their hands as many times a day as I do. Right. That's a fact. And <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to abuse them for it. I, or maybe I, I even will, but but we can still be friends, you know? Yeah. Like, and I, I actually, personally, I embrace that version of racism. And when I've lived with, you know, a good mate of mine that was Greek, we would just abuse each other all the time because right. we needed it. We needed to make fun of it, you know? And, right. But it's like, we it was abusing each other because we had a knowledge of the fact that, okay, we're both weird here. We both have weird customs, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, everybody has their biases and anybody who doesn't think so is really kind of fooling themselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They're all there. Yeah, exactly. It's like when people say that someone isn't racist, I think, no, no, no. Everyone is racist. Just It's just to what, de- it's just to what degree. degree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. I agree. And I found the worst ones, in, in my opinion, the ones that claim they're the least scared are usually the most racist yes. and scared. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The ones that say, I'm not afraid of anything, are horrified <laughs> yeah, yeah. of something different. Or they're, or they're not racist to another um, group of people as long as they remain above them, you know? Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. As long as they're safe. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Before we forget, we need to do one more name drop, at least, for uh, Conan. Yep. Neutron. Thanks, Conan. Oh, yeah. You're turning us on to you, man. And that's another great thing about this era that I haven't met that guy in real life, yeah. you know, but he's a friend now, and I've been listening to – he's churning out those shows, and I've been listening to them. Oh, my yeah. – I don't know how he yeah. does it. He, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's going to be at least a week or so before I get this <laughs> right. thing out. Here's another part of that guy's DNA. I mean, just – and everybody – it's funny yeah. how just talking to a lot of people in, in music and everything else, how many people know him. It's yeah. just amazing. He does a lot of things for the, for everybody in in the music scene. But, yeah, one thing I also want to touch on, me and Jim, I, I know you were talking about <laughs> the differences in the music, but one thing I love about Dead Man, it's not contrived. It's not. Yeah. And it's genuine. That's what I got to say. I think that's one big thing that, that carried you through to us. Uh, when I was listening to a lot of your shit, it was just like, that's genuine music. And that's why we loved having you on the night, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, the only thing I would say about that is when I first started playing music, I felt this need to everything I do has to be really different and unique. Yep. You know, I don't, I don't want to play the same beat as someone else or, you know, whatever. And then a good friend of both of me and Jace, Rayan, he's the bass player in the hard-ons. Uh-huh. And they've been really, really, like, good mentors to, to me in particular. I, I started playing shows with those guys when I was 18 or something. Yeah. And they've always, always been really great to us. And I remember asking Ray about that. I remember sort of saying something like, oh, you know, I'm just worried that sometimes, you know, we write a riff in it sounds too much like someone else, you know, and, and he said to me, uh, 
don't ever worry about that. Just worry about who you are. He goes, we just write songs and we know that whatever we do, they'll sound like us because that's who we are. Yeah. And everything that you do just sounds like you guys because it's you. The funny thing is, again, going back to that language thing, mm-hmm. if I play dead to the wrong person or, you know, to the, a particular person, they might say, like, that just sounds like Metallica. Right. Because mm-hmm. that's their closest reference mm-hmm. point, you know. And so it's interesting that the amount of bands I've discovered because I've been accused of ripping them off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, well, I don't know. Like, it's obvious that we just had a similar approach. But yeah, like, I've never been good at covers or anything. And and I've I've kind of relaxed about that a bit. Particularly, Jace taught me a lot about just having more fun when I'm playing music. And and I'm yeah, Uh, I can do it. I can definitely hear it. Yeah, definitely a genuine band. It's it's refreshing, refreshing to hear. Absolutely. And we'll keep pimping you out, man. For sure. Thank you. You want to say any good exit stuff? Uh, I just want to say thank you to anyone that wants to listen for that long to <laughs> me talk about my band. <laughs> <laughs> well, we enjoyed listening. Yeah, we definitely did. As long as we got through to the three of us, that's what's important. Yeah, right. And and also just for the US friends, or oh, and for the Australian friends, if they're listening, that we will be back as soon as we can be. I just don't know when that is. Oh. Yeah. yeah, we'd definitely love to help you grow here and maybe you can help us grow a little yeah. bit down there oh, for sure no I, I, i'm so excited that it's like cool now we have a reason to go to missouri because it's yes. never yeah. come up before. Oh, cool all right jen from dad thanks for listening everybody good listening on determine the podcast have a good night Woo-hoo. thank you